And we're going to continue. It's, it's, it's fitting because we're going to talk about um, uh, the second chapter of Jonah this morning, Into the Depths. Um, and it, it connects um, a lot with um, going through dark seasons in life. So let me pray, and then we'll get started this morning. King Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to be here And thank you for the privilege that we can call on you, Lord, and that when we're weak, you're strong, that you love to hear your children cry to you, and that that prayer is a gift to us to call um, on you for help, Lord, the one who can do all things. And so we ask for your help even now, Lord, at the opening of your word, that you would shine the light of Christ into our hearts, that you would convict us of sin, that you would comfort us in our sorrow, that you would encourage us um, and edify us uh, in our hearts, that you would strengthen us for your service, that you would embolden us, God, to live lives of faith and obedience to you. Help us to learn, Lord, what you'd have to say today in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in the book of Jonah. We're going to be in uh, primarily chapter two uh, today, but we'll start with the last verse of chapter one. We're talking about this remarkable account and um, of a prophet named Jonah who lived shortly after the time of Elijah and Elisha, a man on the run who had received a word from God and then immediately decided to run from God, from obedience, and ultimately from God himself. But we saw some remarkable things already, and that is that even a man who's running from God, God still used him. God still used him to to draw these sailors uh, to himself. And we saw how that, that the story behind the story was that in all of Jonah's running, God was running both to the sailors and to Jonah himself. And in chapter 2 here, we see Jonah uh, in the belly of a fish, coming to terms, coming to grips with uh, his decision to run from the Lord. Uh, He had run from God, and so God hurled a storm after him, and the result was Jonah being hurled from the boat, and God was going to get Jonah's attention in the depths, in the depths. And that's what we want to talk about this morning as we talk about into the depths. Uh, We're going to begin in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, all the way through the end of chapter 2. If you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word, Uh, beginning in Jonah 1, 17. It says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, And the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight. Yet, I shall shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. The word of God. You may be seated. Of course, this passage is very fitting, and maybe some of you have prayed a prayer like this before. This is Jonah's dark night of the soul. And the first truth uh, that we see this morning is, number one, that God sends us into the depths. God sends us into the depths. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you look there in 
chapter 1 verse 4, it says that it was the Lord who hurled a great wind upon the sea and a mighty tempest there. Um, in verse 17, it says that the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. In chapter 2 verse 3, Jonah says that it was you, Lord, who cast me in the deep into the heart of the seas. A major theme in the book of Jonah, if you haven't picked on, a, on it yet, is the sovereignty of God over every situation that Jonah finds himself in. Even in the depths of the sea, in the belly of the fish, Jonah is there because God wanted him there. He had run from obedience to God, and God went after him and threw him into the depths. The first lesson I just want to point out here is that there is no one on earth more miserable than a sinning Christian. If you can sin without feeling any guilt or conviction whatsoever, then there's a good chance that the Holy Spirit of God is not in you. But if you are saved, and the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, and you do know Jesus Christ, then God your Father is not going to let sin live in your life rent-free. A sinning Christian on the run is a miserable Christian. His disobedience and the guilt and shame in his heart because of it leads him into inner turmoil. And there's usually anger and frustration and bitterness and despondency. And lots of times a Christian who's known that he's sinning oftentimes is frustrated at, them, at himself or herself. And so they begin taking that frustration out on others and the relationships that they're in. Inner turmoil, despondency, a sense of meaninglessness or purposelessness can all attend the soul of someone who's on the run from God because you're out of fellowship with God and you know it. And so we should not be surprised then as the Bible speaks uniformly throughout the whole scriptures that God goes after his children. Even if that means sending them into the depths. Uh, in Hebrews 12, there's the, a very important passage about the discipline of the Lord. And this is what it says in Hebrews 12, 4. It says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which you have all participated, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So God was sovereign over Jonah's life. Jonah was a child on the run. So God sent him into the depths. It wasn't because God didn't love Jonah. It was because he loved Jonah. That he sent him into the depths. And in the depths, Jonah was a, a, a place of complete despair. I mean, we, we just read it. Look again in verse 4. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to a land, to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Jonah was in the deepest darkness of his life. Again, what the Puritans called the dark night of the soul. Now every, now every hard season isn't necessarily uh, because of a sin, can be, but it's not necessarily. God has many reasons for what he does. And he doesn't have to explain himself to us. We just have to trust him. 
We don't always know why God puts us in deep darkness, in the turmoil of the soul. But the, the lesson from Hebrews still stands. Don't despise the discipline of the Lord. In the, if you're in a dark place in life and we, you're, you know, as they say, you're in one, you're coming out of one, you're going into one. God always has lessons for us. There's always something for us to learn. There's always something God wants to say. And so if there's a lesson for us today, it's this, don't despise the discipline of the Lord. Don't, don't, don't waste the hard seasons of your life. Those aren't seasons to just, just move on and forget. They're seasons to learn about God. They're seasons to learn who he is, what he's like, how he's faithful, how he's true. Because God is working something in you. And he's going to use you to work something in others. So number one, God sends us into the depths. Number two, God finds us in the depths. God finds us in the depths. Look there in verse two. Jonah said, I called to the Lord. Out of my distress. That's a good thing to do. I called to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. Sheol was the Hebrew term for for death. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. When my life was fainting away, verse 7, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Verse 9. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed, I will pay. Now this is Jonah crying out to God, and we know Jonah has been on the run from the Lord. And now here in these prayers, he's saying, I know I will look upon God in the temple. What I have vowed, I will pay. My prayer came to you, uh, and you answered me. And so if you look at it at face value, you may say, well, you know, that's more of Jonah finding God than God finding Jonah. But I just want to say, what's the difference? Romans 3.11 says, no one seeks for God. And in John 4, when Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, you know, she was the one coming to the well, but Jesus was the one waiting for her. And Jesus said, those, the day is coming and is now here when those who worship the Father will worship in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Brothers and sisters, when a person has found God, you can rest assured that God has found them. God found Jonah there in the depths. He took Jonah to a place of total darkness so that he could finally see God. So that he could finally remember God. When his life was fainting away, he remembered the Lord. In his distress, he called upon the Lord. So remember, Jonah was on the run from God. And now he's calling to God. He's calling to God. He wants God again. And guess what? God took him back. So it doesn't matter where you end up. It doesn't matter how dark you get. How dark it gets. You can, you know, the, the prodigal son, you could be in a pigsty halfway across the world and still come home. God is seeking people. God is seeking his people. God found Jonah in the depths. God, Jesus said, will leave the 99 to find the one who goes astray. The omnipresence of God, as we said, is is a powerful doctrine. You can try to run from God. There's just one problem. Wherever you go, God will already be there waiting for you. And yes, that means that even in the dark night of the soul, in the blackest moments of your life, God is already there. He is seeking his people. He is ready to answer when we cry to him in desperation. 
God sends us to the depths, but guess what? He sends us there because he's already there. Waiting for us. God is in the darkness. And if we find him there, it is because there he has found us. So number one, God sends us into the depths. Number two, God finds us in the depths. And then number three, God saves us from the depths. God saves us from the depths. Chapter two, verse 10. The Lord spoke to the fish. And it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So we should note again the, the God's sovereignty here. God spoke to the fish. If you've ever wondered, can God speak to animals? Well, here it is right here. God talks to fish, and he can make donkeys talk too. I forgot that part. God can talk to the fish. God is sovereign over the wind. He's sovereign over the sea. God is sovereign over fish. So if you like to fish, you better be a praying person because God is sovereign over fish. Peter learned that lesson, you know. Peter learned that lesson. The truth is, is that God didn't start saving Jonah when he told the fish to spit him up. God started saving Jonah when he told the fish to swallow him. Because it says there, the Lord appointed a fish, 117, to swallow Jonah. And that was the beginning of God's salvation because that saved Jonah from drowning. And as we saw there, that it was in the belly of the fish that God found the runaway prophet. And it was in the belly of the fish that, God, that Jonah offered this prayer of chapter 2 there to God. And it was in the belly of the fish that Jonah, in that time of deep reflection was able to see that God wasn't just going to let him be, but that God was going to save him, not just from the sea, not just from the fish, but from himself. From his running from God. And so Jonah already knew in the belly of the fish that God was saving him. I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me from ever, but you brought my life up from the pit. He's saying that in the fish. With a voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. That's Jonah's confidence that one day he will worship God again in the temple. That is, in the belly of the fish, Jonah viewed himself already as saved. Because he understood that God appointing that fish to swallow him was the sure evidence that God wasn't leaving him. That God hadn't abandoned him. That one day he would worship God again in Israel. And so God spoke to the fish and it vomited him up on dry land. God found Jonah when Jonah learned the lesson that he needed to learn. And then he called him out of the depths. And this, my friends... This is the Christian life. This is the Christian life. God is always teaching us something. He always has a lesson for us. And so we should always be trying to ask, what, God, what is your lesson? What's the point? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to teach me? For Jonah, for Jonah that lesson was repentance. He needed to stop running from God and start running to God. I don't know what the lesson is for you. But you should be asking God, what, the le- what is the lesson for me? If the lesson is repentance like Jonah, then it's, just, it's better just to go ahead and get it over with. God leaves us in the depths because he wants to show us something, but God doesn't leave us there any longer than he needs to. And he'll bring us out. And then he'll do what he did with Jonah. And then when we come out, we'll actually be ready to be useful for him. See, God saved Jonah not just for Jonah. God saved Jonah for other people. An entire city. Lost as the day is long. God saved Jonah for them. So God's always at work. 
And your darkness isn't just for you, it's for others. And your deliverance isn't just for you, it's for others. So that you can tell others what you learned in the depths. This was Jonah's lesson. It was Jonah's lesson. God saved him and spit him up on dry land, restored him, gave him his life back, and used him for his glory. It was Jonah's lesson, and also I believe that this was Israel's lesson. You know, we have to follow the trajectory of Scripture here. Jonah is embedded here in the Old Testament. And I think there was a lesson here, not just for Jonah, but it was, I think there was a lesson here for the people of Israel. This was a season, especially for the northern kingdom. They were rebelling against God. They lived in idolatry. They were breaking God's covenant. And God was going to send them into the depths. And he told them that that was going to happen. And we know in 722 B.C., God, uh, the Assyrians came and conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And in 586 B.C., the Babylonians came and conquered the, 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 uh, the kingdom of Judah and exiled them and carried them away to Babylon. And this, by the way, is what Moses told them was going to happen when they disobeyed God. God was going to send them into the depths, away from the land of promise. But again, consistently throughout Scripture, this was amazing. Even in Deuteronomy, Moses' last words to the people of Israel, he says this way before all these things, even centuries before all these things even take place. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. It says, "When all, this is what Moses, he said, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I've set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. And you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If you're outcasts or in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. When we learn the lesson that God wants to teach us, he saves us from the depths. Because as Jonah said, salvation belongs to the Lord. And and God gave Israel all these promises. He gave them the law. He chose Abraham and his offspring. He didn't do that for any other nation. Just for the Jews. He gave them his commandments, his scripture, his covenant. And yet they rebelled against him. And despite all of that, God said, when when all this happens, when you rebel against God, and when he sends you out, guess what? It's still not too late. It's still not too late. Because when you come back to the Lord, he's going to gather you in and circumcise your hearts and give you a new heart. And I, and, I, and I explain all this because when, as the story of Scripture progresses, by the time we get to the, the time of Jesus, we realize that Jonah's story has far greater significance, not, not just for Jonah and not just for the nation of Israel, but it actually points to God's purpose of salvation for the whole world. And this is what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. It says, then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment against uh, with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. 
and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So it turns out that Jonah's story in an interesting way becomes Jesus' story. Jonah was trying to run from God's will, but Jesus was right in the middle of God's will. Jonah reflected the disobedience of his people, and yet nevertheless, God used him as a sign to bring Jonah back to himself. And we can imagine too, and we should, that that Jonah's sign wasn't just for himself, right? We have the book of Jonah. Why? Because apparently Jonah went and told somebody. Right? And And the... and the sign for what? Well, the sign, the sign of Jonah should be that to the nation of Israel, right? If, if God sent a prophet to the nation of Israel, and Jonah was a prophet, and he was three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, and God miraculously saves his life and brings him up to dry land, that's a sign that you should probably what? Listen to the prophet. Listen. But we know from Old Testament history that they didn't listen. The nation of Israel, even after the exile, even after they came back from the exile, if you go back and read the book of Nehemiah, you know, you're thinking, you uh, preached through Nehemiah earlier this year, and you're thinking, okay, things are going to get better. They're back in the land. You know, they're trying to seek the Lord or whatever. But then you get to the end of Nehemiah, which is kind of the latest in terms of the history of the Old Testament. And at the end of the book of Nehemiah, what's happening? He's pulling people's hair out. Because they're going back. They're going back. And then you get to Jesus' day, and you have the religious leaders very scrupulous. They think they love God. They think they obey God. They ask for a son as if Jesus needed to do more than he'd already done. And then we realize that there comes a point where people don't believe, not because they haven't seen enough, but because they don't want to believe. Because they just want to do what they want to do. And Jesus said, no son will be given to such people except the sign of Jonah. This, of course, refers to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The very core of our Christian faith. The greatest, Jesus healed sick people. He commanded a man dead for four days to walk out of a tomb. But the greatest thing Jesus did was die on a cross. And then walk out. A few days later. That's the greatest thing Jesus did. Because in that sign is the very salvation of the world. No sign would be given to them except the sign of Jonah. As God delivered Jonah up from death through the fish, God would literally bring Jesus up from death as validation and vindication like it should have been for Jonah's generation that Jesus was a true prophet of God. And therefore, you should listen to him. Right? When, you know, we we focus on the cross, and we should, but we can never forget the resurrection. Because the resurrection is crucial for for, for the gospel. It's crucial for the cross because if Jesus was still in the tomb, we're just wasting our time. And on... Uh, after on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached the gospel to the same crowds that were there uh, 40 days before or whatever, when they crucified Jesus. All right. He said, he said, you killed him. And this same Jesus, God raised him from the dead. And the, the resurrection was what? It was the vindication and the validation that Jesus was who he said he was, and therefore he needs to be listened to. And the Bible says that they were cut to the heart. And 3,000 people got saved. On the Mount of Transfiguration, James, Peter, and John were there with Moses and Elijah on the mountain. 
And they were all enamored, and Peter was out of his mind, and so excited. And then this cloud overshadows them, and God has this to say. When God, when God audibly speaks from heaven, please listen. Okay, just word of advice. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Folks, that's all you got to do. Life is hard. Life is messy. I don't know what to do. Listen to my son. That's what you got to do. Listen to him. That's the sign of Jonah. And remember what Moses told Israel? Way, way, thousand, over a thousand years before Jesus. Moses said, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That you may live. Jesus said, I have to go because when I go, I'm going to send the helper to you. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Why did 3,000 get, come on now. Why did 3,000 get people get saved when Peter preached and not when Jesus preached? You ever thought about that? It's because Jesus says, Jesus' plan was that Jesus' plan was for his followers to reach the world through the Spirit. What was the difference? The difference was the Spirit of God had come to do what? To circumcise people's hearts. To change people's hearts. So that when Peter preached, the Holy Spirit broke through and convicted them of sin. And led them to faith in Jesus Christ. And 3,000 people were saved. Why? Because God was keeping the promise of Moses. Through his son. God was circumcising his hearts by the spirit through faith. So that they would love the Lord your God, their God with all their heart and soul. So that they could live. God has given us the sign of Jonah. You see, here's the thing. We wonder, and it, I mean, and it's okay in the dark. In the darkness, God can handle our complaints. He's a big boy. You can you can lay it out before God. He, he, he he's not gonna he's not gonna get offended by it. But let me tell you something. God, He'll send us into the depths. But listen, He went into the depths Himself. The God Man Jesus Christ came. And he, he went through darkness that no one in this room could ever experience. Forsaken by God. Bearing sins that didn't even belong to him. So that we could live. Jesus knows what it's like to be in darkness. And he can help you through your you see, Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jesus is greater than Solomon. Jesus is God's beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. And as we close this morning, maybe there's someone in this room I don't want anyone in this room to be in a position one day where the men of Nineveh rise up against us and say, we listen to Jonah. Why couldn't you listen to Jesus? He is God's beloved son. Listen to him. Come home. Turn from your sin. Trust in him. He'll welcome you with open arms.
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, that you're with us in the depths. You're with us in the darkness. That you will never leave us or forsake us. And so, Lord God, I just pray, Lord. I know there's people in this room right now who are in the dark night of the soul. Lord, I pray that as a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, there was a fourth man in the flames. God, I pray that whosoever's in the depths this morning, they would feel your presence right beside them, with them, protecting them, helping them, encouraging them, strengthening them, knowing that you're going to see them through. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And Lord, maybe there's someone in here and they, in their hearts, have yet to truly surrender. Surrender.